Okay. It has been a while. Um, let me see if there is any way to get this where it takes up the entire screen. Okay, here we go. Um, so the last time that we did this is, um, gosh, it's probably been a few weeks before the holidays, possibly. You know how the holidays are. You get pretty busy. And we discussed the origin documents of like the Magna Carta, et cetera, that were uh, from 1100 all the way up until the Revolutionary War, the documents that our founding fathers used as the legal precedent for the document that we're going to study tonight that launched us into war with Britain. A lot of people don't know that our founding fathers worked for over 10 years trying to come to some type of conclusion without having to go to war, but Britain simply refused. And uh, so we're going to go through this. Um, it's uh, one of my, oh, I know what I can do. I bet that made it a little bit too big. Oh, no. Nope, we're good. Okay. Well, maybe a little bit. Hang on. Let me adjust these, the slideshow. Okay. We'll go down here and then here. There we go. New technology, guys. I would suggest that as we go through tonight's training that any aha moments you have, write them down. Uh, watch this video several times. Please share it because we have got to restore an understanding of the way our nation was formed, again, on legal precedent. We didn't just decide to secede from Great Britain. We went through legal channels. And then the things that our founding fathers put in place were meant to protect us from the things that we're seeing happening today. And when you look at the, you know, 1100 Charter of Liberties and you go on down to the Magna Carta, etc. The, the, the final document, like I said, that, you know, we ended up in war was the Declaration of Independence. So that was a legal document that was written by our government. And I wanted to read the entire thing before we dissect specific parts concerning liberty, um, but I don't want to do that necessarily tonight. I would suggest that you would um, research the things that are going on, but I do want to, um, let me pull this up on my phone because I forgot my book. I do want to um, highlight a, a couple of things so that you can see that um, we've got, you know, the initial statement of the Declaration of Independence, but they listed several specific grievances against the King of England that were based on English law and the five documents that we've examined, which you can go back on my feed and look for that video. And we had started to try to persuade the king, who was George III at the time, to follow his own laws beginning in 1757. So it was actually more than a decade. Benjamin Franklin spent a huge amount of his time over in England trying to persuade things, and of course France. But um, here's a couple or a few of the, the grievances that are in the Declaration of Independence that a lot of people don't know. It says he, referring to the king, has refused his assent to laws. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. Uh, he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly, manly firmness his invasion on the rights of the people. Um... He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, 
offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armony, armies without consent of our legislatures. Um, he has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed groups among us, for cutting off our trade, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Let's see. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He has excited domestic insurrections against us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sex, sexes, and uh, conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus ma marked by every act which may define a tyrant, tyrant is unfair or unfit to be a ruler of the free people. I mean, it's, you know, the Indian thing, what's interesting about that is we actually had peace. So, like, if you look at uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, uh, I believe Virginia, these states were purchased from tribal people. And then Britain came in and started uh, creating unrest among the Native American population, and they begin to attack Americans. So the Brits, when they say that they, you know, caused insurrection, that's what they're referring to. We had peace. We did not have any problem with them, and they didn't have any problem with us. But the beginning of it, let me see if I get into this, uh, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now listen to this language, that to, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form. Okay, so the truth that they hold to be evident is men are created equal. That was put in there after much hot debate because a lot of our founding fathers wanted to get rid of slavery. Several of the southern states refused to do so, Virginia, South Carolina, etc. And at the um, I guess you could say uh, angst, the founding fathers agreed to not tackle that issue for 20 years. That's in one of the Federalist Papers because it was threatening the entire formation of our republic. And so they decided to table that topic so that we could form our republic and then revisit it. But what they did is they put that phrase, all men are created equal. Now, again, they're viewing the Declaration of Independence as a legal document. And they knew that at some point, someone would use that phrase to give slaves their freedom. So it's a very interesting thing. Um, the other thing I want to point out is unalienable rights that are given by our creator means that these are natural rights that only God can give his creatures. Our rights were not given to us by man. Therefore, man cannot take them away. The only purpose of government is to secure our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I believe it was John Adams. I did a We the Deplorables podcast on this topic uh, explained that um, the pursuit of happiness is the idea that we are to own land and property, okay? 
But the main thing I wanted you to see is that we've examined five documents that then led to this sixth document, the Declaration of Independence, which is a legal document that our founding fathers created after trying to persuade King George III to follow his own laws beginning in 1757. By 1764, the colonists were enraged by the Sh Sugar Act and then the proposed Stamp Act and other activities of King George. Franklin went back to England and he stayed there for 11 years trying to get the basic rights of the colonists in force. He left London and arrived back in America May 5th and got to work on our liberty. At this point, Ben Franklin knew diplomacy was ineffective and we were headed to war. So the Sugar Act, it was a consumption tax on the colonists in an attempt to recoup the war debt from the French and Indian Wars. Now, anyone remember when we had to pay sales tax on our food items in New Mexico? Or you've got cities that tried to tax people if they drank sodas or sugary drinks. It's a similar thing. It's a cons consumption tax, and it shouldn't be on the people. Uh, George Washington was against any personal income tax because for him, it was like putting his hand in the pocket of another man's pants. And he said it was, it was not right. What they formed was that the states would be uh, taxed based on their, their you know, profits, their income with trade, etc. And then that would go to fund any type of wars that were needed. So the Sugar Act is like a sales tax on food items and anything that you might drink or, uh, of course, eat. The stamp tax was a tax on paper and ink, but the reason they put the tax on those two things is they wanted to prohibit freedom of the press and speech, so it was all a part of a strategy. So in order to enforce the tax, handwritten warrants called writs of assistance were used. These were warrantless searches with no due process that the Magna Carta directed and said had to be in place. So let me see if I can find that again. Um, here it is. For depriving of us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Uh, so that and then the fact that you have to have a search warrant that is, you know, before they can search your home came from the writs of assistance. And what would happen is, um, oops, is that they would go uh, into these homes and they would not just um, search the homes for improper use of paper and ink where there wasn't a tax that was paid, but these people that searched the homes would take whatever they wanted. So if they saw money or jewels or clothes or furniture, they would just take it. And there was no way to stop it. The violators were shipped to Quebec and they were tried under foreign law and no jury of their peers. So that's why that's in the Declaration of Independence as some of the grievances. This motivated James Otis Jr. to fight against these using urgent education, which is where I got the name for these studies, urgent education. Uh, also, uh, the podcast, We the Deplorables, we put all of our urgent education, educations on there. And he wanted to let the colonists know what the Brits were doing and that they were violating their own laws. He was a, a uh, barrister of the crown. So the fact that he was alerting the colonists to what the British were doing shows great sacrifice because he could have ended up in really hot water. But what he did is he ended up in court challenging the British crown on some of these laws. The court decided they didn't want to decide on it, which makes sense, right? Because they're uh, of the crown. But many believe American independence was born then, and several of our founding fathers were sitting in the courtroom. So his ideas and arguments from the court case were circulated in pamphlets years after to raise awareness, which this is a strategy that we can execute today. That's why I do these studies. 
The committees of correspondence in Boston were formed in 1764, three years later, to continue to disseminate truth, which then birthed the Sons of Liberty. I mean, to me, this is fascinating. So, um, getting the word out, we have technology nowadays. We need to get the word out on the things that are being violated. The rights that God has given us that are being violated. Like, for example, the red flag laws of New Mexico or the red flag bill and the limiting of our magazines, etc. The Second Amendment shall not be infringed upon in any form. I understand the desire to keep handguns from the abusive and the, the, um, those that suffer from mental illness. But it says it will not be infringed upon. And so red flag laws are an infringement. And unless you are convicted of a crime, you should not in any way have your guns taken away. Because if you give an inch, they take a mile. Now, I would prefer that people that have mental illness or that are violent not be able to go and buy a gun legally, but I don't want the rights of people to be able to buy a weapon infringed upon at all because that's what the Constitution says. So until that person is convicted of a crime, and I know it sounds crazy, but we have to protect our rights. And until a person is convicted of a crime, they should not in any way have their rights infringed upon. So we have to be careful with these things because public safety is the number one thing that governments use to take our rights. Many more injustices were committed against the colonists. It then culminated into the infamous Boston Tea Party. One of them was disarming the colonists by confiscating ammunition and powder and making it difficult to buy a gun. Sound familiar? So the grievances of the Declaration of Independence were from years of abuse and attempted negotiation because we did not want to separate from Britain, but we had to. So first things first, before we signed our Declaration of Independence, our founding fathers formed free and independent states out of the colonies by ratifying the Lee Resolution on July 2nd, 1776, This established the necessary legalities, which, by the way, I've seen the Lee Resolution uh, in D.C. I've seen the Declaration of Independence. It's amazing. I didn't know they had the Lee uh, Resolution there, so I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see it. So what does this mean? On June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee, he was a delegate for the Colony of Virginia to the Continental Congress, proposed the Lee Resolution. This resolution would establish the following three legal necessities, and I keep emphasizing that because our founding fathers were not lawless. They had legal precedent for their actions. So they resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state, once you pay attention to that word, of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That it is expedient forthwith to take the most effectual measures for forming foreign alliances. That a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and uh, approbation. Okay, now what, what, what is going on here? We had a contract with Britain, the colonists did, and Britain broke the contract. Because they broke the contract, it freed the colonies from British rule. So again, the grievances. George III was not following his own laws. When you break the law, the contract is dissolved. The one to whom the contract is broken is considered a victim, actually in God's eyes. Only the victim has the right to dissolve the contract, not the perpetrator. So we, as a victim of Britain's tyrant behavior, ended the contract with them and then created the colonies into free and independent states. Now, for the founding fathers, a state was a sovereign country. So notice it said the state of Great Britain. They would also say the state of Germany, the state of Ireland. 
So the United States of America is a union of sovereign little countries. Okay? So the state's rights was birthed before the federal government by the people. So the people carry the power. We decided to turn the colonies into free and independent states or sovereign countries. And then we formed the federal government by a compact between all of the, the, the states and decided that they were to handle foreign relations and matters of war. That was it. So on July 2nd, 1776, the Lee Resolution was brought before the Continental Congress. It was debated voted upon, and ratified into law. The states were born. They became legal entities independent of Great Britain. They were given legal authority to for form foreign alliances, which that shifted a little bit when we became a Federalist uh, country. And then as sovereign states, they would vote on any plan of confederation. And we'll get into more of that uh, later. But the first action after that was our independent, or the first action in our independence had to legally be absolving the colonies from Britain and freeing them to be sovereign states. Two days later, our founding fathers signed the De Declaration of Independence, pretty much knowing that they were traitors to Britain and their lives were on the line. John Adams said, you will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more worth all the means and that posterity will triumph in that day's transaction, even although we should rue it, which I trust in God, we shall not. So they knew, uh, Blood was going to be uh, spilt, and we were going to have to spend our treasure for our liberty. So back to the Declaration of Independence, the purpose of government, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, now listen to this, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This was the original 1100 Charter of Liberties, or the 1100, I think it's the Charter of Liberties, Men give governments power. And remember, it didn't last very long. Before you knew it, uh, the king of England, um, Althred the Unready, Unready, when he died, I mean, a Normandy uh, king took over and the rest is history. So the sole purpose of a state government, the sole purpose of our federal government is to secure our God-given rights. This is a just government and a just government is always defined within operating within the consent of the people. So when you look at a lot of these organizations the government has created, like the EPA and the FAA and the FDA and the FBI and the CIA, when you look at all of these things, did we give consent to those organizations? Okay, so there's a lot of things the government's doing that we've not given consent to, that we did not vote was okay. Uh, and, and man, they'll go to extremes. Extremes. I mean, just read how the Federal Reserve was started. It was amazing. It was against our Constitution to have a central bank. And they got it done by World War I. So America's most influential founders had a God-centered view even the least religious, like Ben Franklin, recognized the importance of biblical morality and prayer. They all, and I, by the way, I read his autobiography. It's fascinating. Uh, they also believe that liberty was an intersection of freedom and morality, meaning you have the right to do what you wish with what is yours until it harms or infringes on the liberty of another. So for them, liberty was freedom plus morality. So if you take one of those ingredients away, you no longer have liberty. So if you take away people's freedom, there is no liberty. You take away morality, there is no liberty. Can you see what's happening to our country? Just that truth right there. 
is enough to show you the plan, the strategy to destroy America. The founding, founders of our American Republic, by the way, it's not a, a democracy, it's a republic, drew upon their own history and upon philosophers like uh, uh, Soph Sophocles, Aristotle, Cicero, St. Thomas Aquinas, Francisco de Vitoria, as well as portions of the Bible and the ethics of Jesus for their view of natural law. So when you see natural law, they're referring to the idea, idea that liberty is first a lib liberty from God, and second, that natural law dictated that no one should harm another's liberty. Because again, God gave us our liberty, man cannot take it away. Thomas Jefferson said, And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Now, let me tell you what he's talking about here. He was talking about slavery. Thomas Jefferson was one of the ones that wanted to get rid of slavery immediately. And when he says, you know, can the liberties of the nation be thought secure when in the minds of the people we remove those liberties by enslaving people? I mean, that's what he was saying. And he knew that God was just and that there would come a day where the debt would have to be paid for enslaving humans. Interesting, huh? They don't teach you that in school. Mary Otis Warren, a wonderful woman, a founder as well. Uh, believe it or not, women had lots of rights. Though we are daily threatened with the dep depredations of Britain, yet each city stands ready to sacrifice their devoted lives, to preserve inviolate and to convey to their children the inherent rights of men, conferred on all by the God of nature and the privileges of Englishmen claimed by Americans from the sacred sanction of compacts. Okay, so that, that a compact is different from a contract. A compact is an agreement between sovereign countries or states. So that's what we have as Americans is a compact. May nothing ever check that glorious spirit of freedom, which inspires a patriot in the cabinet and the hero in the field with courage to maintain their righteous cause, and to endeavor to transmit the claim to posterity, even if they must seal the rich conveyance to their children with their own blood. So even though our founders had a deep belief in God, they dismissed any state enforced and dictated religious beliefs. They had come from a theocracy, and they did not want to repeat it. You know, the Brits, you had to belong to the state religion. And you could not minister unless you had the credentials of the state religion, even if you did not agree with their doctrines. So the colonies that had tried that repented of practicing the very thing they fled from. I mean, you've got, I believe in Rhode Island, they wouldn't allow Catholics. Uh, in Connecticut, if you weren't of that state religion there, they would beat you. Um, they'd put you in jail. And uh, so... Uh, eventually, you know, they realized, wow, we're doing the same thing that Britain did to us, and they repented and revoked any laws and practices uh, of, you know, um, trying to have a state religion and enforcing and dictating religious beliefs. John Leland, uh, you don't hear of him often. He was a founder. He said, the notion of a Christian commonwealth should be exploded forever. Government should protect every man in thinking and speaking freely and see that one does not abuse another. The liberty I contend for is more than toleration. The very idea of toleration is despicable. It supposes that some have a preeminence above the rest to grant indulgence, whereas all should be equally free, Jews, Turks, pagans, and Christians. They also felt, uh, and I read this in some of their papers, it's amazing, that the beauty of Christianity could hold its own and would be most attractive to any and all who examined it closely. It was not something to force upon the people. Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, he said the religious atmosphere of the country, that's when he visited us, was the first thing that struck me on 
arrival in the United States. The longer I stayed in the country, the more conscious I became of important political consequences resulting from this novel situation. In France, I had seen the spirits of religion and freedom almost always marching in opposite directions. In America, I found them intimately linked together in joint reign over the same land. So this was important because the French Revolution had failed because it was a revolution to remove God. Our revolution was to include God. George Washington stated that if the people ever thought they were fighting for a cause absent God, they would have never fought. So th- this idea of separation of church and state and this idea that God is, uh, should not be involved in our political practices is fake. It's a false narrative that has been created by people that don't want morality and don't want God involved in our politics. Some uh, legitimately believe the things they say, but you can just look at the congressional record all the way from the beginning. God was always involved. There were always prayers. There were always those things. So our founding fathers, the morality aspect, understood that man is not inherently good. And that's a truth that a lot of people don't understand today. They knew that man would tend to follow his own appetites. Therefore, they believed that knowledge and virtue had to be taught. So schools were formed for the sole purpose of instruction in the Bible and morals. I've read the papers. It's true. They were formed for the sole purpose of instruction in the Bible and morals. Before schools, people taught their children at home these things. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, okay, that's an important phrase. So our rights are not limited to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There are many unalienable rights. It's any right given by God that man cannot take away. So the government can't control all the other areas of, of our lives because everything that's been given to us by God is included in our life, it's included in our liberty, and it's a pursuit of happiness. So liberty, our liberty as citizens of America does not come from the government and it does not come from a piece of paper called the Constitution. They exist by the nature of our creation. Sam Adams said among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, the right to life. Second, liberty. Third, property together with the right to support and defend them in the best manner possible. These are evident branches of the duty of self-preservation commonly called the first law of nature. So the self-preservation is where the Second Amendment comes in. So what he's saying is a third property or what you would call the pursuit of happiness. That to them was property. And so for our founding fathers, we were supposed to be able to support and defend them however we needed to, which meant that if someone invaded our property, we could shoot them if we were in danger. If someone invaded our country, we were to defend our property. In fact, now a lot of colonists or colonies, states, but colonies at the beginning, uh, it was against the law not to own a weapon. And uh, I did a deep dive into the Second Amendment, which you can listen to on We the Deplorables. For no people will tamely surrender their liberties, nor can any be easily subdued when knowledge is diffused and virtue is preserved. On the contrary, when people become universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, they will sink under their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders, which is where we're at today. So laws that do not respect life, liberty, and property leads to the decline of society. Any laws that do not secure these rights are tyrannical and must be resisted. And know this, enemies will want to use our laws and government to take over our country. So the mark of a good government, and this is important, is power that comes from the consent of the people, a singular purpose of protecting our natural rights, and that our rights are interdependent. We have property rights, but our rights are also our property. Tyrannical governments 
have no respect for either. James Madison said, where an excess of power prevails, no sort of property is respected. We're seeing that today. James Madison also said it's not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where arbitrary restrictions, exemptions, and monopolies deny to part of its citizens that free use of their faculties and free choices of their occupations. That is not a just government, nor is property secure, where the property which a man has in his personal safety and personal liberty is violated by arbitrary seizures of one class of citizens for the service of the rest. Ooh, ooh. Now look at that. That is, guys, taking your money and supporting illegals. Taking your money and giving it to people who refuse to work. Taking your money to take care of other people of which you did not give permission for your money to be used that way. Liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as the abuses of power. John Adams said, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Greed, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a well goes through a net. Our Constitution, now listen to this, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. The reason we have lasted as long as we have lasted as a country is because we were a moral and religious people. We are not that anymore. And that's why we're in danger. So liberty is freedom plus morality. Okay, so that's tonight's lesson. And um, I hope you got some really good things on this some really good things that you can share with others, please share this video. Please pass these along. Encourage other people to share this. We have got to get the word out. This is urgent education, right? We've got to get people educated on um, what our rights are, where they came from, what is the uh, difference between a tyrannical government and a good government, and then what are the things that uh, we need to have in place to reverse the course this nation is on. Okay, so that is it for tonight. I'm going to put the title here before I end it. Truly is. Okay. And I'm doing a poll here. If you guys could answer that, I would appreciate it. <laughs>